Anybody happy to be in the house of the Lord? Yeah. Hey, if this is your first time here, allow me to be the first one to simply say, welcome home. Right. We're a church that believes in loving God, loving people, and making disciples. Right. Hey, we are celebrating something today called Palm Sunday. And here's how I want to break this down to you. Imagine for a second if you had to explain the 4th of July to somebody who weren't American. Imagine if you had to explain what the 4th of July represents to somebody, let's say, 800 years from now. How would you do that? Where would you start? Where would you begin to explain fireworks and hot dogs and taking time off of work and parades and festivities? All the things that you would look at and say, yeah, it's kind of what it represents, but there is so much more to what it represents. Where would you start? Would you start at um, our tyranny with Britain? Would, would you go through the, the, the wars, the 13 colonies? Would you start in 1776 when there was a Declaration of Independence? Is, is that where you would start, right? There is so much history in something that we know because we live in our culture. If someone says the 4th of July, we understand why fireworks go up in the sky. We have a whole song that's saying about it. We understand why this is a federal holiday and why we take time off to, to remember what our independence means. But if we were to explain it to somebody who is an American, it may take a while. So today we are talking about Palm Sunday and we are explaining a Jewish holiday to a bunch of people who aren't Jewish. Jewish. <laughs> so where do we start? Right. Where, where do we start talking about Palm Sunday and, and there were clothes and we're, we're about to read the scripture. But where do we start explaining all of the significances of a Palm Sunday to people who are reading about a story that happened almost 2000 years ago? You see, the thing about it is when you tell this story to the Jews, there were so many different Jews who understood what was happening. Certain things didn't need to be stated. We don't need to tell you why there is a 4th of July on the July, why we pump fireworks on July 4th and not on Christmas. We don't need to explain that. If you're a part of our culture, you know, yeah. right? But today we're going to read a story that's going to take some explaining. So I'm going to preface this ahead of time. I want you to go on a journey with me. I, I want you to put your cap on to say that I'm not a Jew. But we're going to read a Jewish story about a Jewish man, about a bunch of people doing Jewish things. So that means for us today, we're going to go into a lot of culture and we're going to use the word cultural significance. Things that mean a lot to them that may not mean anything to us. But that's what makes the story what it is. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to the gospel according to John chapter 12. And we're going to read from verses 12 all the way down to verse 19. And then we're going to have a blast. And you're going to leave here, change the world. And we're going to do it all over again. All right. Amen. So John chapter 12, verse 12. The next day. Oh, I'll stop. I hear pages turning. I hear it. I, I cheated. I got an iPad. I, I just I kind of went straight to it. Matter of fact, it was already there. <laughs> all right. I heard the pages stop. Um, if you had Revelations, you're too far. If you had Genesis. If you were to place like Malachi, give up. All right, um, so John chapter 12, verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it was written. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, the disciples did not understand all of this. Some of us still don't. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him, that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard it, him perform the sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look at how the whole world has gone after him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please help. Amen. All right. So let me start this off by saying I got permission from my wife to share the story. Um, have you ever had a conversation with someone where you were saying the same things but meaning something completely different? You see, I had that conversation with my wife. Okay. 
And I'm going to try to give you an illustration of how Palm Sunday and saying the same thing but meaning something different kind of works together in practical life. Um, when my wife and I were getting married, we both agreed on one thing, okay? That when we were married, we want children. We want to have kids. That if the Lord would allow us to, we want to have kids. We even went to marriage counseling. I remember because I hated it, all right? So if you go to marriage counseling and you love it, it means they're not doing something right. And matter of fact, the pastor who did my marriage counseling may be watching right now. So let me tell you, yes, I hated it, all right? I didn't want to show up, but I did. So in the middle of marriage counseling, we ironed out things that said, hey, do you guys want to have kids? And we both said, yes. We were good. So we got married. You know, we're fresh off the honeymoon and we come back and I go to my wife with a glimmer in my eyes because there's pressure on my back. Right. When you get married, what is the thing everybody tells you? When you're going to have kids, stay in my business. All right. So my parents, what was the first thing they, they told me? Hey, when are you going to have kids? And they put pressure on me. I don't want to die before my grandkids show up, right? It was just unnecessary. That's a true story. And then we would go to church, and guess what all the safe folks would say? Oh, when are you going to have kids? We can't wait to see what you two going to make, right, right? You want to judge how my kids going to look, see if we're going to make ugly babies or not. So <laughs> the kid, the people at the church was giving us pressure to make kids. So I went home feeling the burden of the spirit from Christians, and I looked at my wife, and I said, babe, are you ready to practice to have some kids? And she looked at me and said, not yet. I said, but wait, we said that we were going to have kids. And she said, you are right. We did say that, just not now. And I kept saying the same thing. You know how when you're in an argument and you don't know, like, how to process, you just keep saying the same thing over and over again? <laughs> like, they didn't hear you the first ten, ten times? So like, but you said we're supposed to have kids. I did. But you said we're supposed to have kids. Richard, not right now. Whoa. whoa, whoa. Then we, when are we going to have kids? Well, first, I kind of want to go through my master's degree. And then I kind of want to get in my career, because what's the point of going into your master's, getting your master's, and then having kids right afterwards? You kind of forfeit the point. I kind of need to be my career first. But then even when I get in my career, you know how the laws are, whenever you're pregnant, you might not get a promotion, cause all, and all that other fun stuff, right? So I'm listening to her, and I'm like, what do I got to do with me and my kids? <laughs> we said we going to have kids. And what you just heard or two people saying the same thing, but meaning two completely different things. And in the middle of this, you have expectation. And expectation that has not been met breeds one thing. Frustration. So now I'm frustrated at her. She's frustrated at me. I'm looking at her like she betrayed me. She's looking at her like, no, you betrayed me. I said it. You just didn't hear it because you wanted what you wanted. This is what's going on for Palm Sunday. The people want something, and Jesus wants something, and they're both saying the same things, but they're both missing each other because they want what they each want. So for this story, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you three perspectives on this story. There's going to be the perspective of the people, there's going to be the perspective of the Pharisees, and then there's going to be the perspective of Jesus himself, the Savior. And in each of these categories, you're going to hear the cultural significance. We're going to talk about the palm trees and what they represent in each of them. We're going to talk about the donkey that he read up on. And we're going to talk about what that represents in each. And we're going to talk about Hosanna. When he was saying, Hosanna, save me, save me, what that represents for each of the different people. So you got to stay with me because if you fall asleep too long, you might get lost. I'm just giving you a warning. Okay. So let's start this off at the very beginning. Because nothing with God is coincidental. He does everything on purpose. And you need to hear that for your personal life today. Nothing with God is accidental. He does everything on purpose. So where does this story actually start? It doesn't actually start in the triumphant entry. It actually begins someplace else. Okay? The story of Jesus and Palm Sunday, which during this time, it wasn't actually called Palm Sunday. But we'll get to that later. It actually started when Jesus was in Jericho. He was on the other side of Jericho, in a suburb of Jericho. What started his transition from Jericho to Jerusalem, he received a mail. He received an email. He received a letter. He received something in that way of word from a woman by the name of Mary, possibly Martha, that his friend by the name of Lazarus was sick. 
Now, Jesus began to travel from Jericho to the place called Bethany to see his friend by the name of Lazarus. You follow me so far? Right? Okay. So on his way to see Lazarus, he passes through Jericho, and on the way there, he meets this man by the name of Blind Bartimaeus. You know you're bad when they call you by your affliction. He is Blind Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus was blind. You got it. But he encountered Jesus, and Jesus opened the eyes of blind Bartimaeus. And when Jesus opened the eyes of blind Bartimaeus, Matthew 20, 19 says this, and leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Now, keep this right. Leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him because he healed blind Bartimaeus. So in today's language, Jesus is trending, okay? He's out here healing people, and now because of that, he has a following. They are literally following him. 15 miles later, that large crowd is still with him. See, we spoil today. We, we, we have social media. We follow people, and we check in on them every day, but they actually walked behind Jesus, like, to really follow him. Let that sink in. So 15 miles later, Jesus comes to this place called Bethany. Jesus shows up, and this friend by the name of Lazarus, Lazarus is now dead. Some of you know the story, right? He shows up, Lazarus is dead, and Mary and Martha, they're screaming at Jesus, if you were here, my friend, my brother would have never died. How could you do this? And then Jesus gives us an insight as to why he let Lazarus die. Let that one sink in. He let Lazarus die. There are some times in your life where Jesus will let things die. Don't miss it. So then he says, hey, do you believe that I'm the resurrection? And she says, yes, I know that you are the resurrection. And Jesus gives this riddle that she didn't really understand, but we kind of know it because we know the end of the story. Okay. Jesus says, hey, anyone who believes in me will never die. Now, if you hear that, you're like, what does he mean by this? Does he mean that we are never going to see death? And then he further makes it more confusing by saying anyone who lives in me will never die, but they will have life. Okay, Jesus, um, what did you have to eat today? <laughs> right? So Jesus makes a statement. But we know what Jesus is really talking about was that if you live in him, he will give you spiritual life. If you are not saved, you live once and die twice. If you are saved, you're born twice and you die once. That is what Jesus is referring to when he said that. Right? So he's talking about a new life that's in him. So here he is, and he's explaining this to somebody, and she's like, yes, I believe. And then um, Martha comes out. Mary comes out. Martha came out first, and Mary comes out. And if you were here, he will be alive. And Jesus says, show me where he is laid, okay? Now, keep in mind, there is a large crowd that was with Jesus when he showed up to this party or this funeral, okay? And he showed up four days late, and the Bible said that Lazarus stinketh, which means in in English that Lazarus Stinks. Um, he was dead. Okay, so he showed up and he said, show me where he was laid. And he tells them to roll the tomb away. If you're a Christian, this should start to make sense. He says to roll the tomb away. And with a loud shout, he says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out jumping in his grave clothes. Jesus called him out of death. He's no longer dead. He's alive. And if you thought he was trending before, my God, my boy, hey, he got that blue check mark now. He is, he is on it at this moment, okay? So can you imagine how much that crowd actually grew? And when he done this, right, um, Bible says in John 11, 45 to 46, therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things in which Jesus had done. So now words are, words are spreading. But can we just go back and talk about the two miracles on his way to Jerusalem? The first one was him opening the eyes of the blind man, and the second one was him bringing Lazarus out of the grave. Don't miss the significance for this, because nothing he does is on accident. The first thing wasn't just this man being blind and him opening his eyes. It was actually significant because we were born blind and Christ opens our spiritual eyes. The second one with him bringing Lazarus from the grave, we were dead in our sins and after we die, he is showing that he has power over death. 
So therefore, if I can raise Lazarus from the grave, when you die, it means I can raise you from the grave so you can be with me. Hence why later on, Jesus is going to say, in my father's house, there are many mansions. And I go to a place for you that where I am, you may be also. Well, how are you going to get there? Well, when you die, the Bible says that one day the trumpet is going to sound and the dead in Christ that would arise first and all those who are alive will be caught up with him. There is going to be another resurrection. And what Jesus demonstrated with Lazarus is... I have the power to raise dead things back to life. All right. So now we're on our way. But there's a problem. Jesus is going into the city on something called a Passover. Again, if you're not Jewish, that means nothing to you. There is nothing in America that celebrates Passover. Okay? So let me explain to you what this was. You've heard this story before. Has anybody ever seen the movie Prince of Egypt? Right. And you had you had Moses. You had this guy by the name of Moses and he shows up. He has this rod and the rod turns into a snake. He picks it up and the knot turns into blood. And then they come to like one of the last things where he says, hey, go get a lamb, a spotless lamb. Kill it. Take the blood. Wipe it above the doorpost. And the spirit of God is going to come. And everybody who the blood is on the doorpost, um, they're going to live. And everybody who doesn't have the blood, they're going to die and that's going to be the last sign and when that happened Pharaoh's son died and he let them go and they crossed over on dry land remember that whole part the Pharaoh's army was behind them but the Red Sea was in front of them and Moses flexed with his staff and he threw it up in the air he didn't do that but he grabbed the staff and then he put it in the ground and the sea parted and they walked over and it was like a big thing if you were a Jew you knew that Because that was your declaration of independence. That was the day where you were under rule and somebody walked in and did a million man march, literally, and walked you out of a kingdom who was the the, the biggest kingdom on earth at that time. He walked you out of it because of the power of God. And what they're doing now is to remember what happened. This is the Passover. The Passover happens in the month of Nisan. And it was a whole week festival that it was celebrate. And on the 14th day of Nisan was the actual Passover supper, which on that day happens to fall on a Friday. Hence, good Friday. Friday. Okay, you see how all this is kind of coming together now? So Jesus is going. But the reason why no one knows if Jesus would go into the feast, um, I think in John chapter 9 and John chapter 10, Jesus kind of makes a statement that gets him in trouble. He says something to the likes of, I and the Father are one. (sighs) Jesus, we trending now. We can't say controversial things, okay? (laughs) If you were a Jew, what that really meant was Jesus is saying that I am God. Me and the Father, we're one. Essentially, you're looking at God in the flesh. And if you were a Jew, you didn't really like that. (laughs) And matter of fact, if you were a Jew, there was... In the Pentateuch, there was a law that said, if anybody said that, you were to kill him. So the Jews kind of posted an um, a APB and said, if anybody knows where he is, bring him and report him. This should make sense to you because he died on Friday. Because they what? They found him, right? The APB, they found him. It's, it's all coming together, okay? So I want you to see this, right? John 11, 55 to 57. Um, now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover to purify themselves. So they were seeking for Jesus. And in another passage, they said they were wondering, is he even going to show up to the Passover? Because there is tension in the area. Now, here is where we're going to look at this from three different perspectives. So that was just all setting the scene to get to all this stuff with palms and, and donkeys and all this stuff, right? So now Jesus is approaching the city. And I think if you were to read in Luke's gospel, because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell this story, but they give you different perspectives, okay? So if you were to look in Luke's gospel, Luke starts off the story by saying Jesus tells his disciples to go to a certain place, and there you're going to find the donkey. And when you start untying the donkey, if anybody tells you anything, tells them the Lord has need of it. 
when I read that, I stopped and I said, Lord, at first, this sounds a lot like stealing. Um, <laughs> go with me here, okay? Go, go with me here. That's all that was told in the story. Go, walk in somebody's yard, find the donkey, take it. If they say, what you doing it, the Lord has need of it, and the story ends. That's it. The next thing, Jesus is riding on a colt. You're like, time out. It's a whole lot of things missing. I love this kind of stuff because it makes me process and think about what potentials could be in these stories, right? And if anybody here has land, you have land because you don't want people on your land. That's why you have it. The more you have, the less you want people on it, right? And you have animals because you don't want people touching your animals. You go to your Publix, your Walmart, your butcher shops, you do your meat. I have my meat. Don't touch mine. I don't touch yours, right? So you're there to keep all of your stuff secure. Now imagine one day you are in your house, minding your business, making yourself some good old goat cheese. And then all of a sudden, you look out of your window and a group of people are walking up, open your fence, walks into your five-acre property, sees your donkey minding its own business that's tied up on a pole, and they go to it and they... They start on tying the donkey, and then all of a sudden, they start grabbing the donkey like they're about to walk out. You rush out of the house. Hey, get your thieving hands off my donkey. What are you doing? And they say, hey, the Lord has need of it. Oh, that's all you had to say? All right, cool. <laughs> you go ahead and that's all you want is a donkey? I got, I got horses in the back. I have what else? What else do you want? Right? Check this out. Now, why is this story so significant? Because we learned that in the Bible, that Jesus speaks to multiple people about one thing. If you remember the story when this guy by the name of Paul saw the light on the road to Damascus, he was blind and he was stricken. But the Lord gives a vision to somebody else and said, go to this street called straight. And there you would meet this guy by the name of Paul. And this man has been afflicting Christians and you are to deliver him. And he goes and he prays for Paul and scales fall down his eyes. And there was this whole thing. I believe this part of the donkey in Palm Sunday is to teach us about obedience. You don't think about the owner who gave up his stuff because of obedience. Yeah. And what God is often saying is sometimes you don't see the reason behind what he's asking you to do, but you need to do it because simply the Lord has use of it. So, pastor, why do we show up and, and why do we have all these different things that we're doing for the community? Because the Lord has need of it. Um, pastor, why do you want us to go to financial peace? Because the Lord has need of it. Pastor, why do we give to the church? Because the Lord has need of it. Pastor, why do we have to give up of our stuff and give to people? Because the Lord has need of it. Amen. And it's about obedience. Now, here's what you have to ask yourself. What would this story look like if that owner didn't give up the coat? Palm Sunday all of a sudden looks a lot differently. And here is the thing. If he would have said no and they were taking it off his land, according to Jewish law, he could have had them killed or he could have had their hand chopped off. But there is the trust of the disciples to say, if the Lord sends me, I'll go. And there is the trust of the owner to say, if God needs it, I'll give it. So for some people in here, the Lord is telling you to go without the resources. Are you willing to go? And for other set of people here, you have the resources, and the Lord is telling you to give it. Will you give it? All right. So now he grabs this donkey, okay? I've seen the movie. It's, it's the donkey talks. So he gets on his donkey, and the very first thing is the people, here's the first category, the people see Jesus as a crown. They see him as a crown. And here is why I will tell you they see him as a crown. Okay? Um, he walks in, and there is a celebration to where they are taking clothes, and they're putting it on the ground, and he is on the donkey, and he's riding on, on, on the clothes. Now, guys, if you hear that somebody is putting clothes on the ground, and they're not walking on it, the donkey is riding on it. What is the purpose of the clothes? The clothes clearly ain't going to keep the person on the donkey clean because they're not even on the floor. The clothes are not really going to keep the donkey clean because the donkey was already dirty before they got there. So what was the purpose of the clothes? Well, they looked at 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 13, and it said, Each man took his garment and placed it under Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, and blew the trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. 
Now, let's talk about this guy by the name of Jehu, because if you're a Jew, you understand, but because you're not, you don't, okay? No fault, you're just not Jewish, all right? So Je um, Jehu came in the era of Ahab. Ahab came in the era, you may not know Ahab, but you're going to know this next person, in the era of Jezebel. How many of you heard Je Jezebel before, right? So anybody here, you ain't got to be in church for five days before you hear about Jezebel. And let me classify Jezebel like this. If you got a man today, if you got a boo thing that you sit next to and some pretty young girl come up and she flirting with your man too much, you're going to look at her and say, you got a spirit of Jezebel. Don't know where that started from, but Jezebel got that spirit, okay? So Jezebel was evil, and Jehu was the king who God raised up to slaughter all of Ahab's and Jezebel's false gods and prophets. So there was a point where he was anointed king. And when he was anointed king, the people came and they took clothes, and Jehu came on the donkey, and Jehu rode over the clothes. And they say, hey, Jehu is king. That was part of his coronation service. So if you're a Jew, you know this. So therefore, when they're looking at Jesus and they're laying the clothes on the ground, they are essentially saying what they said about Jehu to Jesus. Hey, Jesus is king. Now, here is where we're getting some stuff, because you would hear that and be like, Pastor, Jesus is king. But they're saying the same thing, but meaning something completely different. And now you see something with palms. We're going to get to another meaning of palms later on. But in this palm, they're referring to something called victory. Um, there was a Roman philosopher who said many palms equals many victories. Um, if you heard about the Roman games before, they had something called wreaths. And they would give you a wreath whenever you would win the Roman games. Um, certain things represented certain things, right? And palms represented victory. Well, for them, where did they get this from? Have they done this before? Yes, they did. About two centuries before, there was this guy by the name of Maccabee in something called the Maccabean War. And in the Maccabean War, there was a Greco-Roman society that he rebelled against, and he had a victory there. And when he came back home to Jerusalem, they had palms that they were waving to welcome back the ruler who helped them win a war. Why is this important? Because they're currently under Roman rule, and there is a war going on, and they don't want to be in Roman rule. So they're saying, wait, our king has come. And he's going to be like Maccabee, and he's going to deliver us from Rome. Now, you have to remember this. This is the Passover. This is also the time where the people were delivered from Pharaoh. So anxiety is high, things are festive, and they're starting to put two and two together. If Moses delivered the people from Pharaoh, maybe Jesus will deliver us from Rome. And maybe because he's doing all these signs, this is the guy. So we're going to get behind him. We're going to do the whole Jehu thing. We're going to do the whole Maccabee thing. And we're going to welcome him into the city. And we're going to sing a song. And this song is going to say, Hosanna, Hosanna. Yeah. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They're quoting Psalms 113 through 118. They're reading a messianic psalm, a psalm that prophesies of Jesus coming. And here is the interesting thing. Because this is Passover, they know the song. So I want you to imagine the whole country singing the song that they all know. And Jesus is walking in. Ooh, this is beautiful. But the only problem is they want a king now. They want a ruler now, Jesus is on a donkey, but they really want him on a horse. Here's the reason why. Donkeys represent rulers who come in peace. Horses or noble steed represent rulers who come to fight. So they're saying the same thing, but they're missing each other. And now you have the Pharisees. The Pharisee Jesus has competition. You see, the Pharisees are the one who walks around with their pompous robes and they say the long prayers in public and they go about gallivanting in front of everybody else. And what they're looking for is popularity and people to come to them. And Jesus is taking all of their popularity away. Matter of fact, you heard it in a, in a Gospel of John when it says, look, all these people are going after him. We have to stop this. And here is the two things that the Pharisees are worried about. They're worried about the reputation and the glow up of, of Jesus, but they're also worried that Rome will catch wind of what Jesus is doing and Rome will come in and kind of kill everybody, right? Here's the reason why. The ruler of Rome 
People thought that they were, he was a deity. History, historians would say that Caesar, Augustus, like the, the, the beginner, the one who started the whole thing, people believed that he was from the god Apollo. So they had a title for him that every ruler of Rome adopted after him. And that title was called Son of God. Oh, yeah, he gets deep now, don't it? If you're a Christian here and you hear that, the reason why you hear people say, oh, is because there's another man who has a title called Son of God, and that's Jesus. So now you have the ruler of Rome whose name is Son of God, and then you have this man who hails out of Bethlehem whose name is Son of God. And the thing about it is you shall have no other God but Caesar. But this man is saying, no, Caesar ain't God. I'm God. Matter of fact, me and the Father are one. I'm God. And they're like, oh, no, Rome's going to come and kind of kill all this. Okay? Matter of fact, let me give you another Christian trivia that I want you to hear first. Ever heard of the phrase the gospel? You know the gospel didn't originate with Christians, right? The gospel is actually a Roman term. That when the Romans would go out and conquer other lands, they would have what they call the good news. And they would send people on horseback with papyrus and, and statements screaming from town to town, here is the gospel. Rome has conquered another territory. But then Paul takes the language of the time and he transforms it and says, I want to give you the gospel, not of Rome, but of Jesus Christ. And he literally switches it. Mike, could you imagine how the church felt in that day? Okay, we feel crazy now because people take secular beats and put Christian songs over it, right? You hear the stir up, we feel about that now. Imagine taking the gospel. That's a Roman thing and putting it as a Christian thing. You can have that one for free. So here he came, and the Pharisees are seeing Jesus as competition. Um, so John chapter 11, 47 and 48 says, Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council. Here's what that means. The chief priest and um, the chief priest was the one who was over all religious duties in that town, and the Pharisees were some, a sect of religious leaders. They all got together, and they had a big meeting, okay? And they asked a pinnacle question. What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And here is something that they said later on. Because of this, we have to hand him over. That's Matthew 27, 18. So they're like, we don't want no parts of this. We got to get rid of him. He's competition. We don't need this. Let's get rid of Jesus. Okay? And that's why we have Good Friday. That's how Good Friday end up being that whole shindig, all right? So there's the competition that they feel. The, the issue with this is there was another time that the, the Pharisees were religious leaders, and they were supposed to see that during this moment, they were supposed to see who Jesus is. Jesus would have a saying that says, um, if you understood Moses and the law, you should see me. And what he was saying is, if you know your Bible, you would understand that I'm the one that they were talking about. So clearly, you don't know what, what in the world you're talking about. Right? So here's where this gets super important. Um, in your life, in your life, in your life, are you decreasing enough so God can increase? Or are you worried about other things and other people and what they're capable of doing because of the reputation that Christ has? Let me bring this full circle. There was this man by the name of John, and his last name was not Baptist. His last name was a title, John the Baptist. And John's role was to baptize people and be a forerunner for Christ. He was actually Christ's cousin. And John came, and Jesus came, and, and John baptized Jesus, and the dove came down. They had this whole big ceremony, okay? And then something crazy happened. Jesus and his disciples started baptizing more people than John and his disciples. Well, that's a big problem because John's last name is the Baptist, which is a title, right? So he is the baptizer, which means that his sole job is to baptize. He wrote the manual on how to baptize. Fold your arms, hold, hold your nose, go down for three seconds, come back up. That's all John. Like, he did all that, right? So now, in this whole process, they're doing more. They're trending more than John. So his disciples feel some kind of way, and they go to Jesus. And they, Actually, his disciples go to John. John's disciples goes to John and says, hey, Jesus and his boys are baptizing more than we are baptizing. You see the competition? It still happens in churches today, okay? And hey, he's doing more than we're doing. But John says something crazy. We must decrease so that he must increase. John never saw Jesus as competition. John knew who he is. 
and John has to inform his disciples, we're not competing with this guy. We, we have to take a back seat so he can take a forefront. So in your life, what's competing with Jesus? Do you see Jesus as a competition? Is he competing with different elements? Is he competing with your holiness, your righteousness? Is he competing with your ethics? Is he competing with your morals? Are there things that you're putting in front of Jesus that you're saying, hey, I don't have to do this because I don't see him the way that you, you do? Is he a competition in your life? Does he compete with your finances? Does he compete with your relationships? Does he compete with your joys? Does he compete with your thrills? Is he a competition to you? And here is the last one. Scripture sees Jesus as Christ. Don't miss this, okay? First one, the people saw him as a crown, so they had their own motive and intentions. The Pharisees saw him as competition, but Scripture sees him as Christ. Now, let me explain to you what I, what, what I mean by this. What the Scripture sees him as, as, as Christ. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, and he is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. This was a prophecy written in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, that Jesus is going to come in and he's going to be on a donkey. So they're looking at Jesus, and the donkey represents a king who is to come and fight their battles, but Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Scripture tells you who I am. You don't have to go to culture. You don't have to go to your feelings. You don't have to go to anything else. Scripture is going to inform you of who I am. And I'm coming on a donkey and I'm bringing salvation and I'm bringing, don't, I'm bringing salvation. They're thinking salvation is oppression and removal of Rome. Jesus is saying salvation is me removing the spiritual the degenerate that's inside of you and overcoming Satan and raising himself up so that you see him high and exalted. Salvation is me saving you from yourself and evil and raising you up so you can be with me. They're saying the same things, but they're meaning something completely different. So here it is. Matter of fact, there is another scripture in Psalm 22. And here is what they say about the Messiah. All who see me snare at me. My bones are out of joint, but not broken. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. A band of evildoers has encompassed around me. They pierce my hands and feet, and for my clothing they cast lots. What does that sound like? Jesus on the cross. The exact same thing happened. He prophesied this thousands of years. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. I tell you who I am through my word. You can find it there, okay? Um, so now, what is Palm Sunday then? This, this is where we have a lot of fun with this. Initially, Palm Sunday wasn't called Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, okay, okay let's, let's back up. I'm, 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 I'm about done. This is, this is the way I nerd out as a pastor, okay? If I haven't already, this is why I nerd out. Have you ever wondered... Because the Passover, the actual day that they celebrate, is on the 14th of Nisan, which is a Friday. Have you ever wondered why Jesus came into the city on a Sunday instead of just coming in on Friday for the Passover? Because remember, people didn't know if he was coming in. So have you ever wondered why he chose that particular day? Let me tell you something. Because they're Jewish, they understand it. You know what you did on Sunday? You see, Sunday isn't like Sunday today. Sunday today, we come to church, we have this. They do that on Saturday. Sunday for them was like a work day, right? And during this whole week, there's a whole bunch of festivals going on, and each thing means a certain day every day. Sunday is called Lamb Selection Day. Don't miss that significance. For the Passover... Sunday was the day that they chose the lamb that they would slaughter on Friday. So Jesus chooses to come into the city on Sunday because he is the lamb that is chosen for slaughter. Woo! I love this, right? Um, in, in 2 Chronicles 6.6, 6, it says that all men are to appear for Passover, 
In Deuteronomy 16.6, 6, it says, Three times a year all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose, at the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of weeks, and the festival of tabernacles, and no one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. Okay? So now, that's why all the people are there, because the Lord said you should be there. So he comes in on Lamb Selection Day. That was the official title of it, because he's a lamb, right? We got that part. And now, now let's talk about the, the palms, okay? Um, they are doing the equivalence of what I said early on. They are using fireworks in Christmas. And if you were a Jew and you're hearing about the palms, you're like, why are you using palms for Lamb Selection Day that's not when we use palms. You see, when they were taken out of Egypt and they came across on dry land, the Lord gave them different things to celebrate. And one of the different feasts that they celebrate is called the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacle means to dwell. And what that was saying was Jesus didn't dwell in houses or things, but he dwelt with them. And they were talking about during that time, the people of Israel, they would actually get palm branches and they would make huts out of it and they would live in huts and then they would travel. So they were to get palm trees and live in huts to remind themselves of how the Lord delivered them. That was the Feast of Tabernacles. So what they're doing now is um, they're taking these branches that is meant for one feast and they're doing it to celebrate something completely different. That's where the palms came from. Matter of fact, palms are used in scriptures for different things. Solomon decorated a whole wing of his temple with palms on it. Um, there was another place in scripture that said they had beautiful palms, and palm was their, like, signified thing. Like, Florida, we have palm trees. Hey, we're blessed from God, y'all. <laughs> so, we're coming, and they're using this, and palms were supposed to be a symbol of victory over oppression. And that's why they were using palms. But scripture says why they should use palms. It is to remember what the Lord has done in their life. And then finally you have Hosanna. Hosanna is actually a song, a song of redemption. Lord, come, please help save us. They wanted to be saved. And the Lord is saying, no, the song is true, just not in the way you think it is but I'm going to do both anyways. I'm going to save you from Rome. I don't know if you know this today, but I don't think Rome is over the Jews anymore. <laughs> He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this, but just not in the way that you, you think. But I'm also going to save you from yourself, and I'm going to save you from hell. So Jesus comes in, and he does that. And, and here's, here's, here's a big wrap-up for this. Um, the people saw him as a crown. The Pharisees saw him as competition. But the Bible see him as Christ. And the ultimate question is, where do you get your information about Jesus from? Where you get it from determines how you see him. Is it a crown? Is it a competition? Is he Christ? And I, I just want to spend like two minutes talking to you about something. Um, on the way, again, in Luke's gospel, um, after Jesus goes in, he looks over the city of Jerusalem, and the Bible says that he weeps for the city, and he begins to cry. Now, Jesus wept for Lazarus in John chapter eleven thirty five. The Bible said Jesus wept, shortest verse in scripture. When we look at the original language there, it was a silent weep. Um, in the streets, we call this a thug tear, okay? So it was just a tear that came down. Do you know what that is, though? It's, it's a tear that came down without anybody crying, without anybody weeping or saying anything. It just drips down the side of your face. Um, but when you look at the original language for Jesus looking over the city and weeping, it was a loud outburst and a cry. And the reason why he did this is because in his foreknowledge that he knew that in 40 to 60 years, there was going to be a siege on that city and a million Jews were going to die. And he wept over the city because he said, if you had only knew about the day that is before you now, if you only accepted me now, essentially I would have been able to save you from what's to come. But because of your disobedience, because of your rejection of me, this is coming your way and you don't even know about it. And he wept for them. And I read that scripture and I felt the weight of it, not as much as Jesus did, but I felt the weight now for the first time ever in my life that I ever felt before. Because that is essentially the weight that I feel for our city. 
I was talking to one of our staff members and I was telling them about the outreach and how we are praying to do more outreaches, but more strategic outreaches in our city. And I started crying because I was like, man, I feel the need of our city to know about Christ. And sometimes I come over here and I drive around here at night. You'll be surprised at what you see and what you hear. Now, if you drive around here at night, be careful. Don't Things happen. But when I see them, my heart was broken. I drive around Mango, I drive around Seffner, and I see a city, I see, I see a city that needs Christ. I see a city that needs the gospel, and my heart is broken for them. And then I see our kids, and our kids inform, they are informed about Jesus from the culture. Don't miss that. I'm going to put this in perspective for you. Your kid goes to school for over eight hours a day. Whether that school is over and they're in aftercare and then you pick them up and you bring them home. For most of us, when we pick our children up, we just have time for dinner, to read them a bedtime story, and we send them to bed. You know what that means? They are spending a lot more time with your kid than you are. And in the middle of that, here is where they get informed about Jesus. They get informed about Jesus by what their friends say about Jesus. Your God is supposed to be all loving. If he is all loving, that means he accepts me just as I am. And I shouldn't have to change because God is loving. And if you don't accept this this portion of me, then that is considered hate speech because God is love. But that's not who God says that he is. God does accept you for who you are. But God says, be holy as I am holy. So when you come into his presence, the sign that you are of God is that you don't want to stay the same way that you were like before you met God. So you are transformed in his presence and you become an ambassador of him by living according to his lifestyle. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means to be Christ-like. But if you don't teach that to your kids, they're going to learn that from the culture. As a matter of fact, when they were singing Hosanna, those were songs that they were singing that everybody knew. And as we know, songs have power. The psalms that you love the most, they're a psalm of David, a psalm of Asaph. And these people were choir directors. The psalms, a lot of them were actually songs. And now songs carry theology in them. So therefore, if you were to hear about some of the songs that our kids are singing today, it carries theology. There was some songs by some people by the name of of, uh, Nicki Minaj and, and all these women who were singing about sex and what that means and all these things. And our kids are bopping to it and they're dancing to it and they're creating dances and putting on TikTok and it's trending and they're part of a fad because everybody else is doing it. But the songs are poison. And they're getting their theology from the culture. But here's the thing. This isn't a bastard church, and then I'll be out of, out of your way, okay? Um, here's the thing. The church, we see it, and oftentimes we do nothing about it. Because we then say, oh, God is going to take care of it. But God is looking at us and saying, no, 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 you're my hands and feet. You should take care of it. So here's what I have to say. The Bible says we should be wise as a serpent, but harmless as a dove. If you look at a serpent, a serpent knows how to blend in. A serpent knows when to strike. A serpent knows when to shed the skin. A serpent knows when to eat, when to grow. That's what makes it one of the most feared animals on earth. It understands its environment and it uses its environment to its own strength. A dove is simply harmless. It's beautiful. It's majestic. And God is saying his church should be both all at the same time. So therefore, that's why when we talk about a church and using strategy, that's why we look at what the world is doing and we say, we don't want to be like the world, but we want to know what they're doing and we want to give counterattacks because our God is real and their God is not. So we want to be wise as a serpent. So be wise about where your kid is learning about God from. Be wise about where you're learning about God from. Hey, everybody who preaches ain't preaching the same gospel, y'all. So the way how you test what I'm saying, the way how you test what they're saying, you take it to the scriptures. Today I have shown you scriptures to prove that what I'm saying is true. Take it to the scriptures. So as you prepare for Holy Week, um, this would be a perfect place to plug in. Normally on this Wednesday, we would have worship and prayer, but we are, we're, trans, we're moving that. So this Friday, we would have Good Friday service. 
So there'll be nothing here on Wednesday. Good Friday, we'll come in at 7 o'clock, and we will have a Good Friday service, which is building up onto Easter. Easter is this Sunday at 1045. We're going to have one service outside. And uh, my, my plight, my, my burden to you is find somebody who needs to hear about Jesus and invite them. When you walk out on the black table, there's going to be cards on the tabletop. We call those invite and invest cards. Take as many of them as you want and pass them out this week because we're believing for God to bring salvation to the hearts of many this week. Amen? All right, so I'm, I'm closing, but I wouldn't be able to close if I didn't give an invitation, okay? Um, there are some people who know Christ as a crown, a competition, but people who know him as a savior. So maybe today is your day where you had one version of him, but today you know him for who he really is, which is Christ the Savior. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, and I want to slow down for this part. If you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that he was raised from the grave, that salvation is yours. It's not based on the works that you do, but the God that you confess and you live after. So there's no such thing as a sinner's prayer. You won't find that in scripture. But what we do is we give you a prayer that's modeled after Romans 10, 9, and 10. The prayer itself doesn't save you, but the meaning of the words and your confession in your heart, that's what saves you, okay? So with every head bowed and every eyes closed, I want you to repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I believe in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross, and he rose on the third day. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, with every head still bowed and every eye still closed, if you said that prayer, surrendering your life to Christ for the first time, saying, Lord, you are my king. On the count of three, we simply want you to raise your head. No one is looking around. We just want to signify and see who's making a confession of faith today. If that's you, on the count of three, one, two, three, if that's you, raise your hand all over this place. Let's see it. Let's see it. Amen. Amen. See you. Amen. Amen. All right. You can all pick your head up. Um, if you raise your hand today at the service, we're going to have some people at the front. Um, please come have a conversation with us. We want to let you know what it means to walk in this new life that you've just entered into. Um, we love God. We love people and we make disciples. That's that's the last part. We want to make you a disciple of Christ. Um, hey, this is Holy Week. Um, I get, I, I'm admonishing you, grab the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and start reading about what happened this week. I guarantee you it's going to bless your life. Can we all please stand? Um, I'm going to say a benediction over you, and directly after this, um, we're going to be dismissed, okay? Um, so this is your farewell goodbye until we see each other again. Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for Lamb Selection Day, which is now Palm Sunday. We thank you that you have come in on the colt with humility, and you are still our conquering king. We thank you for all the things that you have done for us, and Lord, we give glory to your holy name. I pray that you be with us this week and speak to our hearts and allow us to take in the things that you did for us, things that we don't even fully understand. I'm asking that you commune with your church this week, Lord, and this Sunday, we're praying that lives will be saved as we celebrate your resurrection. So now unto the king who is eternal, immortal, invisible, the only only wise God, to him with the glory, the honor, the dominion and power, now and forevermore, and let the people of God say amen. amen. You're dismissed, church. <laughs>